uh, I'm Osage, and so there are some Osage citizens that still have head rights, and um, those were based upon the original Alates. We struck oil, for example, um, and um, at one point the Osage, I think, uh, were the wealthiest you know, nation per capita in the world just because of our numbers, but also because of the oil that was struck. So there was a lot of money there. So those mineral rights, they were um, sometimes taken out of families and they were kind of put in ownership with non-Osage and also with institutions that are non-Osage, like churches, for example. Minimally 20% of the current Osage head rights are still not owned by Osage. They are still being, the, the funds from those those head rights are still being distributed to non-Osage. There's this movie coming out, um, The Killers of the Flower Moon, so that will tell some of that story. Um, but just this situation where maybe a non-Osage uh, married an Osage woman, for example, and then the head right was distributed over to that individual, and then it, it moves out of the Osage family at that point. So there's a many reasons why those things happened, but that's just one example of some asset stripping, but also, um, you know, mismanagement of individual Indian money accounts by the federal government, um, you know, uh, divulging of personal information from various federal programs about either, you know, tribal information or, or otherwise. Yes, yeah, so this is our 20th year. Um, as a coalition, grassroots coalition, really women-led, um, and so the, um, the coalition was started with some support for, from the Center for Social Development at Washington University in St. Louis, and also with some support from First Nations Development Institute, and then, you know, a lot of local Native asset building practitioners. So it was really initially kind of peer networking, peer learning, and then, um, you know, eventually training and technical assistance, and then over the years, We've grown. We are a national native led nonprofit. And so, you know, we are running seven different programs <laughs> under those kind of four hats. One is that uh, we are a direct service provider. So we, you know, administer our own asset building programs. The direct service provision would be uh, where we are providing seed funding for children's savings accounts. We know that. Uh, by providing a $100 opening account deposit, this is not going to pay for college. But um, if families are able to put a little bit of money in, some are putting in $5, $10 a month, uh, some maybe at birthday or at a, you know, a special holiday. Um, and then if you can cobble that together with other outside scholarships, we're trying to start uh, the youth when they're younger um, with opening the accounts and then help their families to think that it can be an option to go to school and the kids too. So it's, it's kind of about changing the expectations and um, trying to build in more hope there. To our knowledge, are the largest seed funded Native Children's Savings Account program uh, for youth, Native youth in the country. We kind of frame this whole piece, all of ONAC's work within this idea that um, we want culturally relevant asset building. And so not just assets as money, but this broader understanding, assets as kinship, sovereignty, food security, spirituality, our arts, our languages, you know, all of these pieces together. When we talk about Native assets more broadly, it feels like the light bulb kind of goes on with the families and they're like, okay, yeah, this is safe enough to, to participate in this program. It builds more trust. And, um, and we're also trying to say we're doing what we can to build individual and family and community assets. You know, part of this idea about not just individual assets, but a uh, whole family and whole community is that we're doing multi-generational asset building work. So we're also then working with the families, let's say a parent or grandparent raising grandchildren, to then open an emergency savings account. So we uh, provide a $300 opening account deposit for those accounts. And um, the idea is how do we help uh, families get a bank account that is safe and affordable, but also just with a little bit of a cushion in. We also provide free financial coaching across the United States to any American Indian or Alaska Native, and we do it by phone and teleconference. From 2017 FDIC data, 50.5% of American Indians and Alaska Natives are unbanked and underbanked. Some uh, have historical distrust of financial institutions because 
you know, in earlier times, maybe the, the financial institution didn't treat them very kindly. There are costs to opening a bank account. Um, so, you know, you have to have an opening account deposit. And so we're trying to reduce barrier to entry by providing some incentive money to help people if that's the case, given the resources we have, which we're still working on raising more funds to kind of expand that. This uh, next month we're launching down payment assistance. So that'll be 5,000 a family. We have some funds raised from the Federal Home Loan Bank of Topeka. And so they can layer it with other assistance that might be available to them. Um, you know, obviously the affordable housing market <laughs> has become crazy also during this pandemic even more so. So uh, we hope that it's gonna be enough to help people that are of lower incomes be able to make it work. We also are an intermediary grant funder. Uh, so we are about to distribute funds uh, to support more native voluntary income tax assistance sites for the next year, and also to help them have some resources to try to promote this child tax credit outreach. We think that the native VITA uh, or voluntary income tax assistance sites where they help people prepare their taxes you know, for free are really an important component of the asset building story because then those um, sites you know, they can also connect this tribal citizens to other social services, to other asset building resources, but then, you know, really keep the money in the community. They're not paying an outside tax preparer. So um, we love VITA sites and they really have a profound impact and can help people claim those uh, various credits. And we administer the National Native Earned Income Tax Credit and Voluntary Income Tax Assistance Network with Patsy Schramm, who's Cherokee, and um, she coordinates that for us. So we're lucky to work with her. So we've been providing these uh, trainings for individuals that teach Native-specific financial education and do the coaching, and now we, um, I think, are gonna kind of expand with a, a series. We'll offer some still more of those kind of particular trainings, but, you know, thinking about um, just webinar series asset building and racial equity, native asset building and racial equity, kind of where does all this connect? How do we make it work when we still have a large unbanked, underbanked population, remote, rural, digital divide, all these things, like just the practical, nitty gritty stuff. I mean, that, that's a lot of what ONAC does. I mean, it's not very sexy work. It's just troubleshooting, constantly trying to figure out how do we make these programs work? How do we administer them? How do we help support others that are administering them? And try to keep building it out. That's, you know, in an integrated fashion that's culturally relevant, you know, and doing the best we can with the resources that we have.